And, and I'm going to try and keep the introduction down to 30 minutes. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, it's all, always a pleasure when we have Professor Emmanuel de Tournay as, as our speaker. And uh, Emmanuel is currently the uh, Theodore W. Bennett Chair Professor in Mining, Engineering, and Rock Mechanics in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at the University of Minnesota. And he holds a mining degree from the University of Liège and um, MSc and PhD degrees from in, in geoengineering from U, University of Minnesota. And prior to joining the university in 1993, he held various positions. Um, in consulting companies, including Itasca in Minneapolis, Ad Gabian Associates in El Secundo, California. And he did um, 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 stints with Dowell and Dowell Schlumberger in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and with Schlumberger in Cambridge, England. Uh, and so, as we all know, his expertise is in geomechanics, and he's got two current research focuses. Uh, only two? Oh, well. Uh, drilling mechanics. Uh, bit rock interaction in particular, and self-excited drilling vibrations. Drills, drill string borehole interaction. I mean, things that really interest us uh, these days in subsurface access. And many, many others that, that you can read for yourself. And as the co-author of 140 papers, we've read many of his publications uh, in refereed journals, um, and we may have seen um, his nine um, patents somewhere. He is also uh, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. So, Emmanuel, real pleasure, and, and thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, uh, and, and maybe you'll just indicate, you know, once again, that there will be a follow-on to, to your presentation in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yes, I, I will. Thank you, John. You, you forgot to mention that you were my boss for a couple of years. <laughs> when I was... <laughs> <laughs> well, the anyway. last two weeks <laughs> <laughs> two, two years two years not two weeks no. oh i see <laughs> so let me let me share uh the, let me find where my okay this all right so you can see my screen yes Okay, first of all, I have to say that this is joint work with, uh, with Anthony Pierce of the Department of Mathematics at the UBC. And uh, so I have also to, I have to say that you know, this is a kind of a warm up talk you know, for his, his presentation in two weeks' time, which is more on the application of what I'm going to, to present today. So actually what I'm going to present is, is as you can see from the title, this multi-scale type asymptotics. Is basically uh, for for deflating hydric fracture with Likov. So this is basically giving the some of the technical plumbing that is needed to construct solution that uh, that we can use to interpret uh, pressure decline uh, analysis in, part in particular. So the 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 question is why why we should we model deflation of an hydric fracture? So as you, you all well know. That most of the works, modeling work so far has been focused on propagation of hydraulic fractures and, and to, for example, to determine, for example, how the, how the footprint is, is extending. You have. Uh, sorry, I have some, some work. Okay, so some, some noise here. Okay. Uh, how the footprint is, is evolving as a function of time. Uh, all the, uh, the the dependence of the footprint and injection pressure on the the rock and fluid parameters. You know, uh, so that is has been the focus of the modeling work. But mm -hmm. I would say that very that there has been very few, there have been very yeah. few contribution uh, direct at developing models for recession and closure, following shutting and flow back. You know. And that that kind of a question, for example. Uh, that you can you can read on on the slide that for for example is the fracture when the fracture is closing uh, is it closing at a fixed or shrinking footprint and that is going to affect of course the the pressure decline uh, in in as it is measured could be measured in, in the in the well bore okay and ultimately what why we're interested in, in modeling uh, the deflation of an hydraulic fracture is, is in a sense is to be able to interpret the pressure decline or other parameters 
in order to determine the incident stress and the leak of coefficient. And as you all well know that uh, so far, I would say that it has been done using very empirical procedure and not so far using uh, models or there have been models, but they've been uh, developed under very strong assumption, for example, the Nolte analysis of pressure decline, assuming that, that the footprint of the fracture does not change during, uh, during shooting. So uh, let me first uh, kind of describe what the different phases of um, deflation once we once we shut in, uh, let's say that we're looking at at radial fractures, so that we 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 everything is happening on the front at the same time, so we don't have a, it's a homogeneous, and so we can look at if you look at the at the little sketch here on on the, on the right here we have at time ts the, at the shut in time in general the fraction will continue to propagate now there will be readjustment of the the pressure in within the within the fracture but it's going to propagate but it's going to slow down as you can see here from from the plot of the radius versus time and at one stage at one time uh, at time ta then there will be the fraction will be arrested and then from that point on it will start to, to deflate, but at the, with a constant footprint. And as it is deflating, the stress intensity factor is going to decrease. No? It's going to decrease progressively with time as, and as the fracture is leaking off from, from, from the, sorry, the fluid is leaking off from the fracture, causing a decrease of the pressure, causing a decrease of the stress intensity factor. No? At one stage, the, the the stress intensity vector is going to be equal to zero, and then the fracture will start to recede at time tr. No? And so the, the question that we, we would like to, to be able to answer is that, uh, first of all, identify the time at which the fracture will be arrested, no? how, to determine, uh, the, how to determine the evolution, the stress intensity factor during the arrest time, when when it starts to recede, what is the velocity of the the t velocity during recession? Okay, so and also the closure time. So that's really the question that we would like to to be able to answer using using model and construct and constructing model to do so. So uh, here I want to stress the the difference between the conventional approach to do uh, to model shut in no. And what we are what we are doing, you know. And in the conventional approach, really one implements what is called a width constraint. So the fracture is deflating. So the, you have a, you have a, you have a system of uh, of cells, which could be, for example, displacement discontinuity could be finite element, you no. Know? And the one is monitoring the width of the cells, and when the the width the aperture of the crack in the cell become drops below a certain value, then we, we assume that this cell is being closed. Now that is the, the kind of the standard way of modeling um, deflation. And really what we want to do is here is to actually tra track explicitly the front. And that will require, uh, as I said before, that will require calculating the stress intensity factor during the, during the arrest time and also calculating the velocity during the recession. And what you, you see on the sketch is actually is kind of a, a, a system where we could imagine that part of the crack is still uh, arrested, you know, the, the red part here, the red boundary, and part of the, the, the boundary is, uh, is receding. And you can see that we have this kind of a, uh, this kind of signaling type uh, condition where the product of the stress intensity factor times the velocity is always equal to zero. So in one case, we have, if it's receding, the stress intensity factor is equal to zero, but we don't know what is the velocity. And when it is arrested, we know what is the velocity it is, of course, equal to zero, the t velocity, but we don't know what is the stress intensity factor. 
So, uh, you know, and this is really the, the topic of the talk is that uh, what we're going to do, and if I maybe I can go back to the, the previous slide when you have this kind of a yellow band here that is being drawn um, behind the, the front inside the, inside the fracture, is basically is developing the asymptotics uh, of the solution in this band. That's really what 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 I'm going to talk about. No? And we, we know from from work done, let's say, about 10 years ago, uh, and there's still some 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 work in, in that area, uh, looking at, for example, at uh, complex fluid, uh, is that we, we know that using tip asymptotes uh, is extremely useful to construct solution because we can uh, use fairly coarse mesh uh, if we, we 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 apply the appropriate type asymptote, and that, that has been documented in several papers. I refer in particular to a paper by by Bruce Le Campion and, and others, which uh, which shows that no by using uh, com by using those type, those complex type, type multi scale type asymptote during propagation really facilitate the calculation and improve the accuracy of the calculation. You know, and also uh, enable to do calculation at, at uh, uh, more efficient calculation of uh, of the evolution of the fracture. So, so that that is, I think, is well documented. You know what's uh, what's happening. So, it's, uh, I'm not going to discuss that. You no, know, it it is uh, basically kind of a, this kind of a boundary layer near the near the tip of the fracture. Where in general you have a kind of multi scale asymptote where you have different behavior taking place at different distance from, from the tip. And we can use, as I said, we can use this information to construct efficient, uh, efficient code. No? No, the, we, but what's happening now if it's deflating? And again, the, the question is that, can we, use, can we develop tip asymptotes no? to, to help determine the stress intensity factor during arrest time? And again, to, to calculate the tip velocity during recession, uh, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. And and I kind of apologize. This is a bit of technical talk, but uh, but I mean uh, we need to we need to go through to some 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 construction here of the, the asymptote and explain how it is how it is done. So the uh, so what uh, really what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look to zoom at the tip. Of, of the fracture and write the equation in a system of coordinate which is moving with the tip. So X is this moving coordinate system. So first of all, we have the elasticity equation. So when we zoom, we can we, we have this kind of this is integral, this cosh, singular cosh, cosh integral over this infinite interval. And that's by, by some kind of rescaling can show that indeed the solution near the tip must, must satisfy this integral equation. We have the Poisson law, this so-called cubic law, law, which relate the flux to the, pre to the gradient of the pressure. We have the continuity equation uh, expressed in the moving coordinate system. So you can see here you have two terms. You have the term that the dw dt in the, at the moving, at the x, again, which is moving. And then we have the convective term associated with the movement of the, the tip. We have the Likoff, uh, Likoff uh, equation, and I want to say here that uh, when the fracture is propagating, and if we assume that Carter Likoff, then we know that this uh, Likoff is, is singular. It has it has a square root singularity uh, respect to the time uh, at which uh, the, the the exposure time. But uh, when the fracture is at rest or it is receding. This leak curve is not singular anymore, and actually we don't we 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 can even get away from from the Carter leak curve. We just assume that there is a there is a, a law for, that tells us what is the leak of uh, leak of rate, but um, but the whole construction that I'm going to 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 outline today assumes that this leak of is not is non singular and that's that would be an important point and then we have this condition at the tip where the um, in terms of the stress density factor uh, that 
k prime here is the, the toughness you can see here that we have redefined uh, the all the parameters by prime just and that is done simply to get rid of of uh, of numerical coefficient here that we can just to simplify the, the expression. Okay. All right. So that is what is the governing equation. So really what, what I'm going to discuss uh, now in a bit more detail is how we can construct solution that satisfy those equations, at least in particular the continued equation that which term are dominant you know, in uh, in in the in the balance uh, in the in, in this balance equation. <coughs> so the first thing that, that I'm going to do is to look at very particular solution of the, the form which is which is here. Now those are actually the Eigen solution of this uh, integral operator that I've uh, shown before. Uh, this integral equation. So so we know that we know from from uh, the classic work that now if we if we have this kind of a uh, uh, power law for, for the aperture near the tip, then, then the pressure will, will have this form, the net pressure will have this form. But it's a particular case when uh, lambda, so, so lambda, if equal to one half, would be the kind of the classical LEFM, but we can have lambda up to in the range from one half to one. Um, and if if lambda is equal to one, so therefore that means that we have a linear variation of the aperture in the tip, then we can show that uh, the pressure the pressure will have logarithmic sing logarithmic singularity. So so this is is a very particular case that we need to derive this expression by looking at what uh, at the finite fraction, looking at the form of the solution near the tip. Of, of the fraction. Okay, so now we so we have expression for, for corresponding and consistent expression for for the, the the aperture and the pressure. From that, we can derive the, the the pressure gradient and then calculate the using Poisson law can calculate uh, give expression for the for the divergence of the flux. No? So. Um, and so what, what we, at this stage, what we have, and, and those expressions, of course, depends on the value of lambda. And then what is left now is to look at the continuity equation. So we have used, we have used in, uh, in, in our tools toolbox, we have used elasticity, we have used the Poisson law, and now we have to see how those, 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 those terms can, can combine in the continuity equation and what would be the, the dominant balance in the continuity equation. Okay, so I'm going to look at that at, at a different stage in the deflation. And again, those are particular cases. No, I'm going to after that I'm going to to general generalize. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the end of the propagation. So it is it is after shutting the fracture is slowing down. We can show that because of the velocity, the tip velocity is going to zero. Um, it it means that the, the the solution near the tip is going to be uh, dominated by by uh, the LEFM. So so now we have uh, in this tip region, we know that the toughness, uh, the stress test factor is equal to the toughness, and then that uh, the, the the form of the solution is going to be uh, to uh, x to the one half for the for the aperture. Now. Uh, if you now look at, look at the, the, the continuity equation, well, we can we can show that uh, the dwdt again in the moving economy system is subdominant because this term is going to go to zero uh, as x goes to zero, but all the other terms are singular have exactly the same singularity. You know, so all those three terms uh, balance they have this uh, square root singularity uh, of them. Okay, and uh, the pressure uh, as a logarithmic singularity. So that's what we, we can see from, from an, uh, analyzing the equation near the end, at the end of the propagation phase. Now, now the, 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 we, we switch, now the velocity becomes equal to zero, the, the fracture stop propagating, we are in the RS phase, no? And then things change, because now if you look at, um, 
if you look at the, the continuity equation, you look at the term again, the DWDT is, is going to be uh, subdominant because this term is going to go to zero as at the tip, no? The, the second term, the convective term, uh, is also equal to zero because there's no velocity, the v, v equal to zero. And so we are left with only two terms in the balance equation. And re, re, I remind you that the Likov is not singular anymore. And so therefore what we have, we have, and we are going to assume now that in this region near the tip, the, the, the leak of is actually uniform. So actually I'm going to use a G naught here, and which is finite, it's going to be a, in general a function of time given by the, the, the leak of model. And so you can integrate, and then you get that the, the flux is going to be equal to G naught times X. No? So we, we have dominant balance. Then we can, we have this expression for Q, so we can now uh, integrate with the equation. And then we can find that um, you can find that the pressure uh, by from the Poisson equation is actually finite. It's finite, and you can see that from this expression here, it's a constant here. The p naught is given correspond to we need to solve the finite fraction in order to determine what is p p naught. But we have a term here which goes to zero. Uh, already, however, look at the fact that we have one over LK to the three uh, power three over two, and this, uh, this this is a length scale, which is proportional to the stress density factor uh, square. No, K is, is a stress density factor. It's not the toughness. The toughness is K prime in in this notation. So what we see that as the the as the stress density factor decreases as a function of time during the, the arrest time, well, this term becomes larger and larger. And eventually will become singular when the stress density factor is equal to zero. That means when the, the crack will start to, 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 uh, to recede. <coughs> yes, so the, we look at the next, next term now. Sorry. So what's that mean? Okay, um, which is uh, just at the transition between uh, arrest and recession. And so now, now, we, now the question, we don't know at this stage for at ex this exact time of transition, we don't know what at this stage, what is the form of, what is the exponent for the power law for the aperture. No? Again, remember that I am I'm assuming this form of the power law, but we don't know what lambda is. No, we knew that when in the RS phase, when the stress density factor was smaller than the toughness, that lambda was equal to one half, because this is kind of a classical LEFM with uniform, uh, with non-singular pre uh, pressure inside the crack. Okay, so now what again? So uh, DWDT is again, is, goes to zero. Uh, the, third, the second term in the, in the in the quantity equation is also equal to zero, so we, we have the same kind of balance, no? But we don't know what is what is lambda. So what we we, we know from from the continuity equation, we get again that the Q is proportional to is equal to x times times the leak off. We also know the flux. We can derive the flux using elasticity and Poisson law. And out of that, we find that this Poisson uh, index is equal to three to the four. No? And so we get actually another asymptote, a new asymptote. You know, this is the first kind of new result that we obtain, that um, we get this, this particular asymptote, which applies exactly at the moment uh, when k, the stress density factor is equal to zero, and the velocity of the t velocity is equal to zero, which is this of, of this form where w is. Uh, uh, proportional to x to the three four, and then we have a singular we have a singular pressure again, and the singularity is x to the minus one one fourth. Okay, so so that is the that and we we call that an evanescent uh, evanescent uh, uh, asymptotic because I, as you will understand a bit later what what do I mean exactly by that. And then we have now after that we have the, the next next form. So let me oops, yeah, so 
we have a receding fracture. So again, we are looking at, at a solution of, of this form, uh, W being a polo uh, of, of X. And again, the question is what is lambda? So now we can, we look again at the balance equation. And then we see that we have other terms, like another term is, is going to balance the Likov, no? Uh, this, in this, this time, the, it is the VDWDX, no? This convective term, which is going to balance balance the Likov, no? Which again, I remind you that the Likov is finite, no? The other terms here, the DWDT and the, D, and the, and the divergence of the flux, uh, are uh, sub subdominant now they uh, those terms goes to, go to zero uh, at x equal to zero while the other terms are, are finite no so out of that we get that actually the lambda now is equal to one that means that we have a linear variation of the aperture in the tip and again the pressure the pressure becomes uh, as a logarithmic singularity so we have this kind of uh, interesting uh, evolution of what's happening in the tip asymptote, and kind of this is kind of summarized in this plot. No, uh, let's let's le first look at what we call vertex solution. So, when the when the aperture is of this form, it has a, it has a power low. So let's let's kind of go back to that. First of all, let me restate what um, I said. That is at the top. What we see. Okay, maybe what I should show should should show here. Here is the in a sense, the form of the solution uh, as a function of x, see here x equal to zero is the tip, no? Um, and so I'm, I'm showing the, the form of the solution, uh, assuming a power law, and how oh, this is going to evolve with time, uh, with time. So let's let's again go back here to the to the top sketch, no, where we see that we are the, near the end of the propagation, near the tip. Very close to the tip, we have this one one half LEFM behavior, but further on, at some at some places in some region, we have um, an asymptote which is controlled by by leak of and viscosity. Okay, that is something which is which has been well understood. No? Now we go back and we stop. So we 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 the, the velocity of the, the velocity of the, the the tip velocity goes to zero. We the, the fracture enters the RS phase. We at the moment at that moment we just enter the RS phase. The stress density factor is equal to the toughness. We have this one half asymptote. Again, very well known, very classical one. Then time goes time goes on. The stress density factor decreases progressively. Let me jump here uh, to the final time the time at which the k the stress density factor is equal to zero then we see this this new asymptote that we call the g asymptote where the exp, the polar exponent is equal to three four and the uh, and the pressure is the pressure is is singular and again let's go once uh, sometime later on uh, during recession the recession is well established we have we have this uh, r asymptote where the the width varies like is proportional uh, is linear varies linearly with position from the tip. Okay, okay and you can see on the left here how the pressure is is varying. So it was first logarithmic is singular, and then becomes finite, then becomes singular with the power law, and then it becomes logarithmic singular again. Okay, no. So those are, are particular solution, but in general. Let's look now at the RS phase. No, so when the when the at, at the beginning we have the one half dominating the tip, and then at the end of the RS phase we have this G asymptote dominating the tip. What's happening in between as time goes on and the stress density factor decreases is that we see. Uh, in the early stage of the RS phase, we see the apparition of the threefold asymptote, the G asymptote. And the region where the one half and the three four uh, uh, apply are changing with time, with the region where the one half is, is taking place shrinking with time, and the region of the three four growing with time. Okay. So that is what's happening. So, so we have kind of a trend of evolution 
of the, the tip asymptote during the arrest phase. Similarly, uh, in the, uh, when we look at the, the recession, so we, we start the recession right when V was, uh, V becomes negative, you now it is receding, we have the G asymptote you know, uh, controlling the, 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 the tip, the tip region. At the same time, as I explained, we, we get this R asymptote where, the, where we have linear variation of the aperture. But in between, in the early time after, after recession started, you know, we have again a, a progressive change in the asymptote. What's happening that as soon as the, the, the factors start to recede, there's a very small region near the tip where we have the R asymptote. And this, as the, the, the velocity is actually increasing uh, in absolute term because it's negative, yeah, then the region of the R asymptote, the blue one, is increasing progressively with time, and the, the threefold is decreasing. Uh, so this is really the, what this is really the, 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 the picture. Okay. And as you will see, this is critical in order to determine, to be able to determine the stress intensity factor during the, the RS phase and the tip velocity during the recession phase. Now the question is what's how do we construct solution in between what we call those edge solution. So when we have, for example, in the RS phase, we, we have both the one half and the three fourth. And in the recession phase, we have both the one and the three fourth. And that is called what that is called the connection problem. So let me let me go to 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 that. So let's look at at what's happening during the uh, the RS phase. No? Again, you see the picture here on, on on the left here, where with this transition between the 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 LEFM asymptote to the G asymptote, and then the evolution of those two regions where the one half and the three fourth uh, dominates dominate the solution as a function of time. Well, what you can do is you can rescale uh, this, this problem in such a way that we don't see the dependence of um, the, the, the solution on, on the stress density factor. So what, what I'm trying to say is that no, we can, by rescaling that, we can actually construct a, what we call a universal solution, we call the KHG asymptote, no? which is kind of pictured here on, on, on the right, where near the tip, near the tip, it is, uh, the solution is given by LEFM, and further away from the, from the tip, the solution is given by the, the three-fourth uh, polo index. No? But by the rescaling, we, we, are, we, are, fi we are fixing the, the, the region where those two asymptotes uh, uh, apply. And that, that is shown here, no? uh, in, in a, when we look at the variation, it is, uh, the solution is put, is put in a certain form here where we have x to the one half divided by this rescale aperture, this w hat, no? uh, this w hat, which is defined as the, the w defined by this, uh, uh, this com composite length scale here. No? And we see that in, in near the near the tip, the way x hat is very small, we see that we have the one half uh, LEFM, and at large distance from from the tip, you no, know, in this scaling, uh, we have the the three fourth. Okay. So we 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 have this kind of universal universal solution. Uh, again, uh, it requires a, a scaling, uh, rescaling of the of the equation. And we have the same same story with um, same story with the, the asymptotic field uh, in the in the recession. So again, remember that we go we evolve from from three fourth at the beginning of the recession uh, to, to to a one. So uh, the R asymptote, no, and in between this trans this, this transition. Uh, just after the, uh, the start of the recession, where we have those two regions of the, the where the G asymptote and the R asymptote uh, um, uh, are applicable, again we can do some rescaling so that we have kind of a universal solution where we have um, the aperture can be uh, is a, a rescale 
is a unique function of position v scale. You know? And uh, you, can, you can see the definition of X, the, this new, the new uh, coordin the coordinate and the aperture and the expression for this, uh, the scales here are given uh, at the bottom left of the, uh, of the screen. Okay, so again, so we, 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 can, we can calculate those, those, those asymptotes once and, once and for all. Uh, how to calculate them? It's it's uh, it, some nitty gritty details. I'm just, I think I'm just going to flash the. I'm just going to flash the. Uh, the way to do it, it's we it's basically you, uh, inverting. We start by inverting the the uh, the integral of the elasticity integral. You no, know? so we get uh, we get uh, the this this form here where the kernel is actually uh, not non singular and then we have this dpds that we can use the we can use the lubrication equation to express the gradient of the of the the pressure in terms of the of the opening and the, whether we are in the rs phase or the recession phase the expression for the dpds uh, is is different for the gradient of the pressure is different and so we can then uh, solve this it's a it's a it's an integral equation, freedom integral equation. Uh, we can solve using uh, using quadrature, simple quadrature. Okay, so that that is what is uh, what is done to calculate uh, to to construct to the asymptotic solution. Okay. Now uh, I'm near the end of the talk. I just uh, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, how we use it. No, uh, let me let me let me outline it. No, so here is kind of a sketch of uh, let's say uh, a KGD or radial fracture. So we have uh, we have two cells here. So we have the, the in red here is the tip cell, you no, know, where we we and we assume that in the tip cell and in the cell next to it, you no, know, the uh, those two cells are under what we call asymptotic umbrella. So the asymptotic solution applies for that. So uh, so the way it works is is as follows. So we solve we assume at a certain tip asymptote you no know, to start with so at at n so we know we assume that we know that what is the aperture in that in that in that last cell then we go into we look at all the other cell and we, we and uh, we look at the equation uh, and uh, in the discrete form of the elasticity and lubrication equation that gives a nonlinear system of equation that can be solved. Once we, we have solved that, we know what is the aperture at, at the particular stage. We know what is the aperture at the cell n minus one. Uh, once, then what we know is that because we assume that this under a symptomatic umbrella, uh, we, this solution has to satisfy the 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 tip asymptote. So, and for example, if we're in the RS phase, we need to the solution needs to be in, in a scaled form needs to be on that on that on that solution. So, we that triggers some kind of a, a iterative scheme, forcing in a sense the solution to be on that on the, on that on that curve, and uh, and that's once we have that we have identified in a sense during the RS phase we have identified. What is the stress intensity factor? And during the recession phase, we have identified using that scheme. We have identified what is the velocity of the of the receding velocity of the fracture. Okay, so that that is what is uh, how we use it. You know, in in a, in a, in a very, you know, quick quick way to, to tell you that. And then um, just to show you that is I'm going to show you a, a movie that's uh, courtesy of uh, Anthony. Who, who, who has developed the code uh, to uh, to use the to solve the, the problem during the evolution of the fracture during a recession and, uh, and during RS and recession? And let me just show you, um, guide you along this plot. So in in the top left here, we we see the the radius. It is the the, the simulation of a radial fracture. So we see here the plot of the radius versus time. The next one is the uh, efficiency versus time. So efficiency is the volume of the fracture divided by the total volume of fluid uh, 
injected. And the third one is the, the pressure, um, the net pressure at the tip, near or near the tip. Uh, no, sorry, at the sorry, at the injection well, I'm sorry. The pressure at the injection well as a function of time. And then the, the next two figures, this, this one here in the middle is the, the profile of the aperture. And you see that it's going to evolve with time. And below here at the, at the bottom of the screen, it will be the profile of the pore pressure, the net pressure as a function of, of, of time. Okay. And basically the, the movie starts at shooting time. So I'm going to play the movie a couple of times. Um, Okay, so let me first do that. So it's still propagating, slowing down, uh, slowing, slowing down, stop. No, then you start with the RS phase, the fracture is deflating. Then when you see the blue, it starts to, um, it start to re it's receding. No? Let me let me replay it uh, and, and, and stopping at a few times no? here, okay? So the, what you see, the red bar here is going to show you where we are in time. So we are still propagating. So I remind you that this, this, the, this aperture profile is the aperture profile right at shut in at the end of the propagation. Okay, so now it, it, it pro, it's going to propagate. It is a particular case where at shut in the efficiency was close to one. So uh, it it's still going to propagate a long time uh, after shutting, no? So it's going to propagate. You can see uh, at the bottom of the screen, you look at, if you look at, at the pressure, you see that the pressure is going to, is, is, well, you can guess that the pressure is going to be singular, but as, because we don't we don't see of course the, the the negative pressure what is going to plot here is only the the, the positive pressure the positive net pressure but you can see the, the zero pre, zero pressure is behind the is behind the, the tip okay so so it's still pro, it's still propagating now and if uh, propagating propagating now we see yeah, um, we see now the, the you see the, the pressure. No, we are the beginning of the RS phase. Uh, and you can see, if you look at the pressure profile, you can see that it is no, it is not singular anymore. So it, you have a finite pressure uh, near near the, the tip. No? So the fracture is not deflating, but the, the footprint does not change. The length of the fracture does not change. No? As time goes on, you see the pressure decreasing. You know? The pressure decreasing, and then now we start to, re, to start to re, receding. Now we see that again. We, we can guess that the pressure is going to be very negative. The net pressure very negative near the tip. It's, it's actually uh, theoretically it is singular. It has this. Um, it has. It has. It is. It is becoming logarithmically singular. But what I would like you to, 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 to check, to, to, to monitor, is the aperture profile as a function of time. And you can see the large region behind the tip where you can see that, you can see that the aperture varies linearly with position. You can see that start. You know. See over the large region here, we see this, this linear variation of, of, of the pressure, which leads again to this logarithmic singularity. Okay, so this is actually key to, to what Anthony is going to discuss in, in two weeks' time. Uh, it is a solution, we, we call it the sunset solution. This apply at the end of the uh, receding, uh, receding phase where we have very, actually very kind of very simple solution that develops, you no. Know, and it will show that oh, we can use this solution actually to extract the leak of coefficient uh, from a measure of the, uh, the aperture at the, at the well bore. Okay, so uh, this is this was my 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 last slide. Um, so in conclusion, um, let me just repeat the the, the, the key points. Um, we we we. Developed new type of symptoms that are applicable for um, 
the deflating fracture, whether it's a trace or tree seeding, you know, we show that you know, it goes from, from the one half to the three quarter to, to, to one in terms of the pearl index. You know? um, by by using those asymptotes in, in, in the simulator, then we are able to accurately track the fracture edge during deflation. You know? um, and so, as I've said, just said that those in particular, the R asymptote, you know, this linear variation of the aperture near the, behind the tip, you know, is critical to construct the sunset solution that uh, is this new method that could lead to a new methodology to determine the liquor coefficient you know, that is uh, going to be presented by Anthony. You know. um, this something that, uh, and the details in, in, in the paper at, uh, that is shown here. At, on the, on the slide is that this uh, we can show that in, in impermeable rock there is no re, the, there cannot be any recession. This is called the Stevenson condition. It has been proved using certain approach, but using the, the same methodology of, of dominant balance that I uh, discussed for the case of a permeable rock, you know, we can we can show that the there cannot be any recession in impermeable rock. For example, whether there is even when this flow back, you know, the, so the, the fracture will, will deflate, but at with a constant footprint. Okay, so that's um, that's all I want to tell. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, fantastic. Um, you know, um, we do have a few questions. Uh, do you do you want to read the questions, or do you want me to read them? Uh, let me let me see if I can I can access them. So let me. Uh, I, I have the first question. This is Mark McClure. I could just ask it. Sure. Ah, hello. That would be all right. Hi, Manuel. Um, so uh, I don't know if you've seen my my papers on this topic. Um, I've got quite a few over the past probably nine years. Um, you know, when we run numerical simulations of this, uh, the main finding is that fracture roughness is a really dominant effect. So. If you run a numerical simulation where the crack has roughness, the walls start to contact before the volume of fluid stored per area reaches zero. And then we switch over to a nonlinear joint closure law like a Barton Bandish or something. So when that happens, uh, first, you know, the contact occurs before aperture is zero. And then number two, after contact occurs, those elements continue to store fluid, conduct fluid, and leak off continues to occur off the quote closed parts of the fractures. And in some sense, the aperture is never fully zero because of the joint closure law. So um, have you have you thought about that? In the simulations I've run, the papers I've written, that's the dominant effect. Um, and it really controls the behavior of the pressure signal after shut-in. Um, and also as pressure continues to fall off uh, way below SH min, the cracks still have fluid. And so you've totally deviated from Carter leak off, but you're still leaking off because uh, these closed fractures contain and conduct and leak off fluid. Um, and that has a big uh, effect too. So I was wondering if you've, if you, first, have you, have you thought about that? Have you seen those papers? Uh, and if, if you've thought no. about how you might affect this? So, so, no, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, no, you, you absolutely, you absolutely right that no, uh, roughness plays a role. No, it is of course a very complicated issue because um, what is roughness? No, uh, what's happening when you have a, a, a cake? No, you have some kind of a, uh, due to, due to the due, due to the leak off, you have deposition of, of this cake. You know what's happening there? So um, yeah, so I I, I cannot I, the only thing that we, that we have done is to to as you as you uh, you have as you have heard, is to look at this kind of ideal case, no? Yeah. Where the fracture will, will, will close perfectly and, and we, we have basically zero, um, zero conductivity uh, in, the, in the, the, the part which is being closed, no? The, uh, okay, well, I'll shoot you a couple of papers. Yeah, I mean, I've, I have some figures from a paper in like 2016 where basically the, the pre-closure period is, is pretty important. And then the period when recession is happening is relatively short compared to the full duration of a shut-in. And then the stuff that happens after contact has happened everywhere is most of the test. So um, there's all kinds of interesting things that happen after complete closure, and it's all related to that nonlinear joint closure law and the evolution of the leak-off rate uh, as pressure keeps falling off. So anyway, just yeah. uh, 
I'll have, I'll yes. a couple no, thank, thank, thank you. So the uh, just just to note the the length of the RS phase, um, the length of the recession phase. All of that depends on on exactly where you, where you are, no, in in terms of time scales, no. So we have we we know, for example, for, for in the case of radial fractures so we, that we can analyze that uh, this paper by Anthony on that, which just published uh, last year, GMPS, and this is a version for, uh, for the KGD that was published also last year, where we um, where you can you can show that those. For example, the time of arrest will depend on basically on two on two parameters. No, so it is very difficult to make a, a general statement. Depending on on parameters, depending on time scale, you can have a very short arrest time, uh, arrest, arrest phase, or very long one, like the one that I I have shown for the the movie that that you you have seen is a very is kind of a limiting case where we 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 have this very long period for the arrest phase. So anyway, just. Uh, Okay. Well, anyway, thanks. Anyway, I look, I look forward to look at to look at more details in your paper. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. So, so the next question, Emmanuel, is a, is a follow on that from Igor Donstov, and 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 Igor is is wondering, you know, what happens if propent was in the way? Um, yeah, it is. It, it, yeah, yeah. It, we, we, yeah we, again so it is it is in the same 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 realm of, of what mark uh, is mentioning that because indeed if this prop and there could be some some residual conductivity you know in in the fracture so that yeah so what we have done again is uh, is trying to obviously simplify and trying to understand you know under those very uh, simplified condition ideal condition what is the or is the form of the solution? And maybe maybe it's it's a good point to say that you no, know, uh, maybe I should, uh, should try to reinforce that that uh, the role of all those often those solution, even though they are idealized, you no, know, but they serve as benchmark for codes, you no. Know? And for example, there's a, there's an effort with uh, involving Briss uh, at EPFN and his, his students. Where you know, you, you know that Brice has developed this, the, and his group has developed the, the, this pi frac simulator, uh, and we can we can use the, the we can use the, the two solutions that we are we are developing with Anthony. You no, know? we can use the solution to calibrate the code uh, and to validate the code. And again, I agree. Uh, this is uh, idealized solution, idealized case. But I think we need to understand the idealized case. Before we start to 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 add more physics, for example, as Mark suggests, the, the probe, uh, the, the roughness, or the the propent. <clears throat> well, um, we're we're going to still push the non-ideal situation with the next question, and, and it's, okay. it's, it's <laughs> yeah. Do you do you have I, any? <laughs> I thought that the problem was complicated enough uh, like that. <laughs> well, and, and Santiago wants to make it even more complicated. He wants, you know, do you, um, let's see, how strong do you think the effect of prop it is, even if it does not reach the fracture tip? Is there, are there any analyses available that estimate the range of, uh, of, of where the prop it might get? And that... that I, might be I outside the domain of this. I, 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 I think, you know, we're... we're it, it, well, I'm at a loss for words. Um, and then I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know to, res, to respond because I, I just simply don't know. <clears throat> okay, that's no. It, it, here's a here's a question from Alexi. Um, and uh, if, if you can't read it, I'll just transcribe it. Uh, and, and he he appreciates a, a really great presentation as as do I. And. He indicates that Carter Leakoff is a good approximation for the fluid loss in the middle of the fracture, uh, a, a linear flow situation at an early time, at, at earlier time, short time approximation. But he, you know, as we know, near the near the tip fracture tip and a later time, it it may not be quite as good a pro, an approximation. Do you want to co uh, comment? And and this can be um, outside of the domain of this specific paper. Can you comment? On the applicability of Carter's leak off in in your problem, and whether there are good alternative formulations. 
Yeah, so the, 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 the beauty of this uh, analysis is that it does not rely at all on, on Kartolikov. Uh, so the, the, only, the only restriction is that the, the league of is not singular as it, as it, 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 it should not be. No? Uh, we know that in the propagating fracture, the, the league of singular, the character leak of leads to a singularity no? of, of the league of freight. But uh, as, as, as you will know that as soon as it, it's arrested or deflating, it's not singular anymore. But we, we, the, the, the solution, the, the, the analysis is completely general in that sense. Now we, we have a G not, we, we have a G not, we assume that we know what is the leak, the, the leak of flow, and then you can use this expression. The only restriction that has to be finite. No? Yeah. Um, and, and then I, Igor has, and well, he's got a couple more questions, but the, the first one is, um, it, uh, can you provide a feel for the, uh, the, the length of the, the transition length scales. Uh, how long do these transitions last in time for a finite fracture? And are there cases for which um, it stays in transition for a long time? Or, uh, we reach, or, or do we quickly reach one asymptote and the solution stays there? Yeah, so, so, so again, um, in, in general, we have, again, for, for simple geometry, like KGD or radial, you know, which are very simple. Then we can actually determine you know, that we know that the those phase depends on two parameters. You know? And basically, for example, one of them is the time of shot in the, the, uh, relative to a, to a particular time scale of, of the problem. And then we have another one. So, so it, it all depends. And I think that maybe, uh, maybe when Anthony made, makes the presentation in two weeks' time, he, 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 he can show that maybe spend one he could have one two slides on, on that showing that you no know, that as a function of those parameters you no know, or the length for example the rs phase is, is changing it could be very long it could be very short you no know? and it's very simple to to to, to for example to to think that you no know, if if the if at shut in the the efficiency is very small then you can see that you can send directly that the, the, there could be no propagation after shutting and you could have very small rs phase and then you start to recede no so it it, it all depends no, of those two parameters and 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 so the follow-on question to that was and, and maybe this is something that will come out next week or maybe it's just not mature yet is are there are there signatures Suppose somebody did a defect. Would there be signatures on um, from the defect that would uh, be diagnostic of these transitions? Yeah, that's that's the great that's a great question, and 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 I uh, not going to take tender from from Anthony, but there, there is indeed a signature uh, that we can we can use, and we think that it is we have the tech, there is a technology around. To be able to detect that, and it uh, it has to do with uh, monitoring the crack aperture at the borehole uh, in the late stage before closure. No, but again, I'm not going to uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to divulge all the interesting bit now. Uh, so um, everyone then, needs to mark their calendar for two it, weeks exactly, from no. today. Yeah, as I've said, the the most interesting part is not what I presented. Uh, uh, it is what is coming two weeks time, and the, the, the thing was just to tell you how what we need to to have in order to construct those those those, those very accurate uh, simulator. <clears throat> and Eddie C Ed Ed Siebritz has has uh, the final question um, for today, and and maybe it's something that we do want to defer for to two weeks. But regardless, if if, if you run the simulator that you showed uh, without the new receding tip just using a constant width constraint, when would the comparison be okay versus not? Okay, that is again a, a, great, a great question. Uh, and I think that is what is going, uh, that's the work doing, uh, going on with cooperation with, uh, with Brice, no? And actually we have yes, shown that, no, uh, the, the, the whole issue of course is to know what is the width constraint to put, no? That has always been a question, no? What is the the threshold value at which you assume that the fracture is closed? No, 
But uh, if you properly tune those parameters, uh, Briss has shown that actually we can we can capture very well the solution that can be that that is predicted by the simulator that entity holds. No? Uh, I should say that uh, he has two simulator, one for the KGD, the other one for uh, for the um, for the radial fracture. And it's it's a uh, well they have variation, but let's say the, the one that, that uh, for which I show the result is what we call a moving mesh algorithm. So that means that the the this, the same number of cells, no, and simply the fra the fracture length is changing as a function of time that is calculated. So that is very very it will give you a very accurate um, uh, picture of the uh, evolution of, of the footprint. And actually, though, when you compare that with the result of PyFrac, it's a very close agreement between the, the, the two solutions, provided that the, 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 the width constraint is, is, uh, is small enough. No? And, and I think that maybe one of the, maybe the, the merit of this, uh, this analysis is to be able to exactly calibrate and give confidence to solution, <clears throat> to those numerical solutions, yes. Well, we we have run out of time here, and and we've we've run out of, of questions, at least posted questions. I'm I'm sure there are more, and if you have more, don't hesitate to contact um, Emmanuel or or Anthony. Uh, and um, again, we really appreciate um, this presentation, Emmanuel. It was it was very very provocative. And so, thank you all. We'll see you all in two weeks. Mark your calendars. Yeah. Thank you, John, moderating the, the discussion and uh...